One of my favorite aspects about media is how the more topical and relevant they are trying to be, the more weird and isolated it looks as time moves forward. It's funny to think 2012 was 11 years ago at the time of this recording. Some of you may not remember, but it was the year the Mayan calendar ended, and with it, wild speculations that the world was going to end. Something that, of course, ended up not happening, and with the media cashing in on it and fueling the hysteria with a lot of stories themed around the end of the world. So what better way to cap off the modern story of Assassin's Creed than by theming it around 2012 being the end of the world? I really don't know if this was their plan from the beginning, but after 5 years of build-up, it was time for the tale of Desmond Miles to finally reach its conclusion. This is the game I remember the most from back in the day, with all the buzz going on. Needless to say, a number of fans were disappointed by it. I never found out why as I often kept myself spoiler free, but now it's been 11 years, the game got remastered and most of its technical issues got fixed, so I think it's time to find out if this game holds up well and if the big payoff was worth it. For the final time, Assassin's Creed 3 puts us in the shoes of Desmond Miles. After a very long quest of securing a piece of Eden and keeping it safe from the Templars, he finds out a cataclysmic event is going to hit the Earth. Visions of the first civilization direct him and the modern assassins to a precursor site, where a machine is said to be set to protect the planet from this event and save humanity. But the key to open access to said machine is hidden away, and to find out its location, he has to explore the memories of his ancestors one more. So, for the historical segment, and as usual the actual main story, we get behind the hatchet of Connor Kenway, a young Mohawk tribesman as he is living through the American Revolution. In an interesting contrast to his predecessors, Connor is actually leading a far more humbler life in his village, right up until one day he gets attacked, his village burned, and his mother dies. This attack causes him to be concerned for the safety of his people, and it is after getting in contact with a piece of Eden that he gets given a mission. To seek the Assassin's Brotherhood, and find an important artifact, an adventure Connor embarks on with the hopes that this will keep his people safe, and then find and kill the man responsible for attacking his village. And this only scratches the surface on what this adventure entails. I'm gonna be as vague as possible because there are spoilers, but this is the most unusual entry I have played in the franchise so far, at least in terms of pacing, and I actually like that. We actually get to spend some time with the younger Connor and learn some of the backstory for his parents before tragedy struck, something I always consider great, because spending time with characters is of essence to understand why certain moments are able to hit hard enough. Now, as usual, I am going to highlight what I see is making the game stand out among previous entries, so if I don't mention it directly or only go over it in passing, it's because I already covered it in a previous review. So the first major change I notice is that towers and map exploration have changed. You can climb towers as usual to reveal parts of the map, but that is not enough. To show everything, there is only enough towers to reveal certain points of interest, but finding what there is to find depends entirely on you. This means, even if you play with a minimum pawn, you are now more than ever relying on your eyes for your own navigation. This makes exploration feel a lot more organic, like you are finding side missions and collectibles because you stumble upon them and not because you purchase one of the many optional maps that reveals all the locations. One of the most common complaints I see about Ubisoft Open Worlds is how you get bombarded with icons on your map once the game opens up. I was pleasantly surprised to see content in this game is actually paced out and tied to your progress in the story, meaning you are not going to get everything the cities and the frontier have to offer the minute Connor becomes an assassin. You complete small bits of content here and there, with new stuff unlocking much later. I see it as a way to motivate you to balance doing side content and story content. I like that. What I like even more is how the parkour has greatly improved. Don't get me wrong, this is still far from Mirror's Edge, and you're still more or less magnetized to most places you jump through. The improvement here is that this time around it feels more like I am in control. 
In the previous games, an awesome looking sequence could be easily ruined if you press the wrong button at the wrong time, or happen to be facing the wrong pixel, causing you to take a wrong turn or just launching yourself to your death. In this game, Connor is a lot more flexible. Rather than mindlessly jumping around, you can have him stop at any time and do a quick course correction, and most areas in the game have a quick ledge of ladder you can move out to without losing too much momentum. You even have an easier time choosing where you want him to go, and in general, it starts to feel like my fault if I actually make a mistake. It helps a lot the cities on the frontier are a lot wider and have a lot more possibilities for you to climb or run around in. One gripe I always had with the older games is how the cities were so narrow that you might as well just stay on the rooftops, snipers be damned. This means now I can go from jumping around the higher places to transition smoothly back into the ground and then back up for more vertical fun. It's neat. Just as neat as it is the fact this game has the frontier. I like the frontier. It's not perfect and we'll get to that when I talk about the flaws in this game, but the things that work gave me some of the most fun I had in an Assassin's Creed game so far. Don't get me wrong, Boston, New York and the more set-piece oriented areas are great and fun, but they are more or less part of the course. The frontier on the other hand is a playground full of awesome possibilities. Going from jumping around the trees in parkour, to hunting slash surviving animals and enemies, to actually using the environment around you to hunt Templars in both the open world and story missions, is the closest I have felt to the jungle fun I had in Metal Gear Solid 3, unless of course something better comes out. This gets complemented better by the hunting missions and the frontiersman missions. On paper, these sound just like the typical Ubisoft filler, and technically they are, but the reason I like them is because they are actually making good use of its setting. I believe the best side content is the one that has a bit of story or lore attached to it, to feel like I am uncovering a layer of life to this sandbox and playing in, rather than just completing an objective to the checklist. For the hunting missions, the game asks you to actually make good use of the tools and skills you picked up in the open world, with a failure state if you do anything wrong and the animal gets away, so you have to play it smart, and actually be prepared in advance if you want to land that particular kill. It helps these animals not only have a story explaining why were you sent to kill them in the first place, but also these are smarter than the animal critters in the open world. The Frontiersman missions, on the other hand, are simple campfire stories where you hear rumors about weird things happening both in the frontiers and in the cities. I like them because they are essentially digital tourism. You are having a little moment taking in the environment, while also witnessing the very real-life urban legends that were very popular at the time and are still known to this day. Also, I love them because they got a genuine laugh out of me when I was told to go find a Sasquatch, had a big build out tracking down the creature, and it turns out he's just a nice hairy man trying to chill in isolation from the world. Also, he feels bad for causing rumors after secretly stealing stuff from nearby settlements, and he promised he won't do it again. I take things. I know it's wrong, I do, but I just can't help myself. Thing is, I like my privacy. If I gave you some coin, might you keep my home a secret? I'd be much obliged. There is not much else I can say about the open world, especially when it comes to the cities, and I am saving that up for later. So instead I will say, I like that the open world got a bit more simplified, because that means the dev time for it was instead spent on the real highlight of this game, the naval missions. 
playing to the small bit of realism that a faction like the Assassins need income and a commercial presence in order to fund living expenses and the tools to operate against the Templars, Connor gets to become Captain of the Aquila, a fast ship that you get to use to secure naval rogues for the Assassins and their allies. And these missions, despite being brief, have no right being this awesome. The long and the short is you get to engage in naval combat, honest to goodness naval combat, and it's designed in a way that not only is extremely fun, but also very immersive. The controls are very simple of course, but the beauty is that everything you do has a small delay, because it involves Connor shouting orders and you get to see all the moving parts as your crew is making sure things happen around you. You're not just controlling Connor, you're controlling the entire crew. What makes the naval battles extremely fun is the fact that it's not just you on a flat plane of water blasting enemy ships. You have to account for a lot of stuff, from the direction of the wind, to the waves of the sea throwing you off target, to accidentally having enemy ships ram you. The combat becomes more fun and chaotic when you get your hands on the ship's upgrades. You get different kinds of ammo, from incendiaries to grape shots, to even chain shots that allow you to disable enemy ships and make them easier targets. While in theory you can just spam cannon fire and hope for the best, the optional objectives actually push you to make things a bit more fun. My personal favorites being the ones that ask you to damage enemy ships in a very specific way to expose their gunpowder deposits, to then give them a sweet finishing blow and watch the fireworks. Especially useful if you are facing man of wars or you are just feeling cheeky and want to finish off the enemy with an extra touch. Now, the naval missions don't just exist because the devs thought it would be cool. Taking control of the waters for the assassins actually plays into Connor's main objective of taking out the Templars, leading into an entire story arc where the fun is taken a step further with you and your crew getting to board the enemy ships to finish off the crew yourselves. It is as every bit as fun as it sounds. And from all of this, if you go out of your way to collect all the trinkets or peg leg, you get an entire treasure hunting questline. Kind of this game's version of the Assassin Tombs. All of it to give you one of the best weapons in the game, and also to give you one of the more fun treasure hunts that caps off the whole pirate theme of the naval missions. Kid's treasure is probably inside that pyramid. There is a lot more praise I got for this game, but I also think it is best to get the flaws out of the way, because when it comes to Ubisoft, it is almost inevitable. Copy-pasting content is of course a staple of things Ubisoft gets accused of, and sadly, this game is no exception. Delivery missions, assassination missions, and resistance missions carry the capital scene of being all the same. In the case of the former, it feels like they just wanted an excuse to get you running around the map. For the latter, they try to give it some story element, but no matter how bad it gets, it's all the same objective done three times with the same dialogue every single time. The worst part is you need to do this if you want to get assassin recruits. Somebody stop that man! Good of you to help, but these recruiters are relentless. Somebody stop that man! Appreciate it, friend, but I'm sure they'll be back. There are two other things that I don't consider flaws, but rather oddities and they have to do a bit more with the gameplay and story segregation. See, Connor is easily one of the more noble and heroic assassins I've seen in a franchise so far. He's willing to kill and he is no softy, but he is also an idealist. He spends most of the game expressing how he feels it would be ideal if he could just talk things out with his enemies to avoid bloodshed. 
It's all very nice and it adds to the drama of the story, but I found the early hours very hilarious because Connor will spend time in a cutscene protesting that he doesn't want to kill and then not even a minute later you are slaughtered in an entire army of redcoats. It's just the kind of Jared dissonance that is weird enough it actually amuses me. As for the story itself, I will tell you right away, I love it. I know it has its critics, but I really wouldn't change anything from what we got. To the contrary, I wish the writing team had done more. See, Connor is a Native American living the days of the American Revolution. He's able to pass off as a colonist thanks to having features from his British father and his mentor naming him Connor so he doesn't face as much discrimination than if he presented himself with his native name. We could have explored a lot how Native Americans were treated in that time. We get glimpses of it, but they never truly commit. In the same vein, even though one of his main goals is to protect his village from the Templars, we don't get to see too much of said village once Connor departs to join the Brotherhood, with the fight against the Templars and important moments during the American Revolution taking place. With that being said, the story in this game does a couple of things that I don't see done often in games. For a lot of the excitement and heroism of Connor participating in the American Revolution, there is an overarching tone of sadness and tragedy to his journey. He is very noble and he is very idealistic, but at every turn he has to clash with the grim reality of the war going on around him and that the Templars are not really someone you can reason with. In the same way, Templars this time around bring back an aspect I have only seen on the first game. These guys are villains, there is no question in that. But much like the first game did, getting to them reveals they are not simply mustache twirlers. There is complexity to their cause, and to a degree, it does look like their goals and Connor's goals align. If anything else, both factions agree on one thing. The American Revolution was anything but pretty, and the Patriots were not the greatest of people. It seems your tongue has tasted sour grapes. The people have made their choice, and it was Washington. The people chose nothing was done by a group of privileged cowards seeking only to enrich themselves. They convened in private and made a decision that would benefit them. Oh, they might have dressed it up with pretty words, but that does not make it true. And if you know American history, you'll know Connor's struggles to protect his people are only the beginning, as Native Americans will go on to suffer further discrimination throughout history, some of it continuing to this day. But just because Connor's story is filled with a fair share of sadness and tragedy, it doesn't mean everything is bleak. Because when everything is said and done, his journey has him built up a new home and a new community with the Davenport Homestead. And the homestead answers one thing I always wanted to see in games like this. On paper, it is Connor's base of operations for the Brotherhood, and it is a hub for you to cool down and do the economy minigames that are just part of the course. But in practice, the homestead ends up giving me something I always wanted to see in an open world game, and it's something proper RPGs already get. Small stories about the people living in your hometown. Connor may have come late into the homestead, but as the story goes on, it becomes as much of his home as the village he's fighting to save and protect. As you may progress through the story, you meet people who are either suffering under the British control, or lucky people who are looking for a new home after facing discrimination for either their nationality or their skin color, or people who were simply passing by and turns out the homestead is the ideal place to settle down. It begins as this big, empty plot of land, but if you seek out every new settler as the story goes on, you end up getting an entire community. Each new resident has their own stories and their own plight, and while they are all small stories, they are still great in fleshing out just how much of a light this place is in the darkness of the American Revolution and Connor's own struggles. It made coming back to the homestead all the more fun in between missions. Every resident is actively doing their own thing and living life, and there is even a small mechanic where you have to actively look for them doing some unique activities to register them in an encyclopedia. Something I saw frustrated players looking for to 100% complete the game, but for me, this made exploring the homestead into its own little game, made it feel like this place was truly lived in, and with each cutscene and interaction, it became clear just how much this place and Connor's complicated relationship with Achilles was giving him solace.
I have things to say about the modern story, but for the sake of brevity, I will say this game both improves and disappoints greatly in the direction it takes. I'm saving this for another video, but in general, I can see why this particular chapter in the modern story disappointed many. Either way, as much as I can see how divisive it is, I think Assassin's Creed 3 is a fantastic game. It's a nice change of pace after the Ezio trilogy, and while some aspects of the open world got downgraded, the parts that improved are greatly appreciated. I wouldn't call it my favorite in the franchise, but I can easily put it in the top 3. But of course, I have a lot more interest to play, so that opinion can change. Speaking of changing opinions, from this point in the franchise, I'll be entering the more divisive territory. One where fans will either claim a game is easily the best entry in the series, or the point where the franchise became bad. So it's going to be interesting the direction these games are going to take me, and figure out if the constant disdain people show for this franchise is either because there's some genuine dropping quality, or people simply got burned out.